good afternoon. Uh, welcome to another conversation in global health. I'm Michelle Berry, the Dean of Global Health. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our invited guests. Um, this afternoon, we have Kennedy Odetti, who is one of Africa's best known community organizers and social entrepreneurs. Um, he grew up in Kibera, um, a slum in uh, Kenya that I know a couple of people in this room have worked in. Um, he was homeless from the age of 10 and experienced um, really living in extreme poverty for those of you who have visited Kibera. He had no formal education um, until he met the right partner uh, who really advocated for him to actually uh, attend uh, high school and then Wesleyan College. He managed to graduate in four years. He gave actual the graduation speech at Wesleyan and is now on Wesleyan's Board of Trustees. Kennedy has been honored as a Forbes 2014 30 Under 30 Social Entrepreneur. He's also an Aspen Institute New Voice Fellow and a Clinton Global Initiative Fellow, among many other honors, and I won't go through. But it is quite, I think he's going to share a little bit of that journey, uh, the journey of coming from Kibera, Kenya, and achieving those kind of honors. Um, Jessica. Um, Pasno Ardetti is an internationally recognized social entrepreneur, um, and she serves as Choco's chief operating officer. Um, together they founded Choco, which is Shining Hope for Communities, and this is a grassroots organization that provides a growing range of community services in Kibera. These are two people that really uh, talk the walk and walk the talk, because uh, they're really giving back, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, Jessica is also a graduate of Wesleyan University, um, and she was selected as America's top world changer, 25 and under, um, has been featured in numerous columns by uh, Nicholas Kristof, um, and is the youngest alumni in the history of Wesleyan University to be recognized with its Distinguished Alumni Award. Um, in addition to leading Shoko, Kennedy and Jessica are New York Times best-selling authors of the story of their lives, which is called Find Me Unfraid, Unafraid, Love, Loss, and Hope in an African Slum. Did you guys bring your books? Oh my God, you did not bring them. Next time, we want you to bring them and um, have a signing, but um, we'll leave that for Paul to discuss. Let me just say a few words about uh, conversations in global um, health, and I, I have a lot to thank Paul Costello. Uh, he's our communications officer, uh, runs all of communications for the School of Medicine. Uh, Paul is a fantastic interviewer, worked in the Carter, um, really, really worked with Rosalind Carter's press officer, um, has tremendous experience uh, in giving in-depth interviews. Um, and so thank you, Paul, as always. He's a fellow of the Center for Innovation and Global Health, and we welcome his interviews every time. So, oh, Paul, take it away. Are you going to see the film first? Yeah. Oh. That's right. We're going to have a little bit of a video film to give you an introduction um, to Kennedy and Jessica's work. Urban slums of Nairobi, my home, where I was raised, where I was poor, where I was homeless, where I learned the realities of poverty. No health care, no clean water, and opportunity was limited. But today, these realities are changing. Today, Shining of communities, Shofko is transforming poverty into promise. Over a decade ago, with a 20 cent soccer ball and a vision for my community, I united youth in the slum to make a difference. Now we have a host of communities services that reach hundreds of thousands of people. We started with a simple belief 
The urban poor are industrious, talented, and vibrant. They can transform their communities if they are given the tools to build their future. We could not do it alone. Jessica Fossey, a student studying abroad in 2007, was the first outside person to ever live in the slums. She was integral in creating our programs. We became partners and together developed the model Shofko uses today. Shofko fosters community and combats poverty through girls' schools, clean water and sanitation, and empowerment programs like adult literacy and women's groups. These integrated services transform urban communities and, underpinning it all, health. The lack of healthcare traps people in the cycle of poverty. Our community's transformation depends on a holistic approach to health. From girls staying in school, to parents keeping their jobs, to men and women avoiding HIV AIDS, and unplanned pregnancy. The effects of our health programs ripple through our homes, enabling positive change. Our flagship clinics in Tibera and Madari provide free medical care to the entire community. The clinics specialize in primary, women's and child health care, treating over 200 patients every day. They treat everything from colds to malnutrition to HIV. But for many, reaching our central clinic is impossible. There is an estimated 1 million people living in the slums. With no roads, it is too hard and far for a sick, pregnant, or elderly person to walk when they need help. And so, making our services accessible to all is fundamental to lift our communities out of poverty. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. How many of you read the book? Ah, okay. <laughs> And I wanted to start with painting a portrait of Tibera. Of course, almost everyone they saw the movie. But I wonder if I could start with you, Kennedy. The Tibera of your year. Story. Paint the portrait. Wow, Paul. <laughs> Tibera of my teenager. So very vibrant till today. And there was a poor sanitation, so lack of toilets, crime, and the biggest thing we are suffering from was the hopelessness, the idea of hope, of making it was something really tough, you know? Yeah, so I have to say that the sanitation was a big thing, because you walk on waste. Are you all here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so it was a really, really tough life, you know. And health was a big issue. Health was a big issue. One example is that in my community, when you are sick and you are going to the hospital, which was called by then, it's still there, Kenyatta Hospital, those who have been to Nairobi, it was really whereby most of the poor people were going. But you're going there to die. Every time many of my neighbors are going to the hospital, I'm like, God, gone. It is true. There used to be, you die. So nobody wanted to go to the hospital because there was a big gap between the nurses and the doctor and the community. So we felt that we were very poor that nobody takes care of us. You know, so you go to the hospital to be taken to the mutuary. Move into 
first of all, I, I was saying when I was taking the call, so what's the best for you? I mean, what, what, why move in as a community? Mm -hmm. Why did you want to, to do something no one has ever done? No one's ever done. What's the best for you? It's a good question. I mean, I think that, you know, I was 21 at the time um, and studying abroad in Nairobi. And I think, so, you know, in a, some ways, in a really great way, had never really been exposed um, to the vast dichotomy and the inequality that exists in a city like Nairobi. So on one hand, you have booming, you know, middle class, shopping malls, roads, supermarkets, and then 10 minutes away, you have a place like Kibera. And I think that I was living in the other part, in a homestay with a comfortable middle-class family. And I felt that I wanted to work with Kennedy's organization, with Shopko. And I, I immediately felt that there was this sort of overburden of out, well-intentioned outsiders who wanted to come into a community like Kibera and make a difference. And that I wanted to do something that, first of all, I wanted to really understand in a way that I felt I couldn't if I came by day and at night went back to my comfortable homestay. And I, and I knew, you know, the whole time that I had an option. No one else around me had. I could leave at any time. And I think having awareness of the option and at the same time deciding to be part of the community in a more um, permanent way was did, really important. Did you often think of leaving? I think it was something always present, and I think that, you know, the, the fact that I could leave was something that just really stayed with me, that, you know, any time I really wanted to, that it got too tough or too hard, I could go get a hamburger, or I could go and, you know, go back to Denver, but that, um, and I think that just stayed on my mind, that nobody else around me had. Denver is. I grew up. That's <laughs> um, nobody else around me had that option. Sorry? What about you, Kennedy? When you first heard that she wanted to move into Kibera, what were your thoughts? What did you think of this woman from the U.S. who was at this strange university, Wesleyan, who now wants to come to Kibera and live in the community? Maybe let me give a little bit of an uh, overview of that. So what happened was that I got an email. I used to check my email once in a month, if I can. And then uh, one day I got an email from uh, a young lady called Jessica, yeah, telling me that she wanted to come and work in with us in Kibera. She had a borrowers from somebody else. yeah. And by then I really had this idea of, I was having this thing called Shovko, which was more like community movement. So I told Jessica quickly, like, you know, we don't take anybody unless you have some skills. And to prove that, send us your resume. So Jessica was able to send a resume, which was good, well done. And then she came, and now Jessica wanted to live in Kibera. And I'm like, you are crazy. So that's the answer. I thought she was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're right. <laughs> One of the things that, that you talked about and that we saw in the film, um, is the prevalence of violence in Kibera and violence that you grew up with and violence that death, beatings, gender, especially gender-related violence. But you chose very deliberately. You had a mentor, someone you really believed in and, and, um, and became a follower of the teachings of Martin Luther King. How did you come to decide that violence wasn't the option because violence for many people in Kibera is. And why, what appealed to you about Martin Luther King? I think the philosophy of Dr. King appealed to me when, at the right time, I was very angry and very sad and knowing that I'll never make it. But at the same time, I care about my community. So Dr. King's idea of community, you know, like he has to change the life of other people. So for me, that really appealed to me, you know, and what he has gone through, you know, despite all those struggles. And I think he was able to use his anger in something positive, you know. Even for me to start this movement, I was very angry. 
But let's be honest, after seeing my friend being shot, some of them were going to steal, they die. There's no other way. You know what I mean? The other way is just you to use it to be hopeless and wait to die. But the, uh, the idea of Dr. King that you don't have to wait, we can all change our own lives. And I remember he said something powerful that really catches me, like uh, injustice happening around and you're keeping silent, you're part of it. So that, therefore make you to be part of what? To be part of change. And change starts with you. You know, and then that also goes back to my mom. My mother had me at the age of 15. But she told me something. When we used to be no food in the house and other kids could come and eat whatever we have, I'd be like, Mom, this is not good. Let's save this food. She said, Kennedy, you know what? You don't have to be rich or poor to have an impact on someone's life. So now Dr. King and now my mom, all these things were coming together. And I was ready to do something. Talk more about your mother, because in the book, it, you come to understand what an extraordinary person this was and is, and how she raised you amid pretty terrifying situations. She was often abused, um, poverty throughout her life, then moved back to her village at one point. You built a house there for her. Um, talk about your mother and how critical and important she was to you throughout your life and how she was a key to much of what you've been able to do and the spirit of what you have. So I share a lot with my mom. It's only that she didn't go to school. That's the big difference. She is very powerful and she believed in change. And because she was a woman, she never went to school. So it was very, very, she really suffered a lot. And she had me when she was 15 was also a burden and she's I have to say she's very hopeful because I, I, when I was a little boy I don't know around six I used to have a small gray hair in the top of my 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 head and I was like annoyed with it and my mom was like Kennedy that's a sign of wisdom and knowledge and so I'm like wow I'm wisdom I'm wise yeah you know and then I got the name Kennedy which used to remind me what well, do you know that name mean do you know what that mean mean you are a leader you know what I mean so anyway, so I think those kind of things really empowered me. Other things that she did for me was, uh, <laughs> I grew up in a place where my women were seen as invisible objects. They were not really respected because that's how society was, you know, and they can't get a job as boys. If you, see, if you have two children, you better send a boy to school because they're gonna work in a factory. So one thing that my mom did for me was that I have my sister, I love my sister. So uh, every time, the time for washing dishes, you know, after food, it is normal for, uh, for girls to do that. And my mom will not allow that, will tell me, Kennedy, is, if your sister does it one time, the next one is you. And I used to refuse, so I'm like, no, that's women's job. And my mother will force me to wash dishes outside. And other children will laugh at me, like, you're a girl, Kennedy. And my mom will tell me, you know what, that's when you're a, a real man, when you do that. There's, in this house, you are both equal. And I'm like, wow. So she started to give me these kind of ideas of equality, you know, and uh, a little bit feminism in me, you know, I'm like, wow, I have to respect. And then I, I also loved her, and I saw how much she was being beaten. She was, she was an organizer in the community w with other women, and I really just really admire those kind of values from her. Jessica, you were uh, studying theater in at Wesleyan, mm -hmm. and, and so connect the dots to how someone <laughs> studying theater decides that they want to go to Kenya and then decides that they want to go into Kibera to live there. What, what are the dots? What's the connection? So part of what Kennedy was doing um, when he first started Shafko was street theater. And how they were using it, what did you call it? I guess it was ambush theater. And what they would do is literally on the streets of Kibera, make noise, make a scene, get people to come together and start talking about difficult issues. Issues like gender-based violence, HIV. Um, and so that was how I first heard about Kennedy, was somebody I knew who was doing theater in Denver, had seen him speak at a conference in Nairobi and said, oh, you should work together. But, <coughs> excuse me, um, I think part of it also was a, a curiosity about seeing the world, and that's really, how I ended up in Kenya, and theater was sort of the, the, the thread that started a conversation and, and brought us initially together. And at, at one point, you helped organize community theater, which 
with it and talk about some of the ways in which you worked with the community to, to build on your expertise and to build theatrical skills basically in the guerrilla theater presentation. Yeah, so the first play we created was just about sort of the realities of young people living in Kibera. And so the young people who are part of Kennedy's group came together, wrote their stories, and we created this play about what their day-to-day -day life was like. Um, flash forward about six months later, Kenya in 2007 went through a really horrific period of violence. During the, after the election. Uh, following the elections, exactly. And so after that, um, we used theater as a tool to bring these communities together, who people who had lived together for years had turned against each other in this moment of sort of ethnic hatred being unleashed. And so theater became really a powerful tool to talk about what had happened in this community and as a way to bring people back together. Sort of the narrative of tell your story of, of what happened to you. Exactly. That's sort of what you were trying to do. Yeah, I think theater. A truth commission. Absolutely. Of. It was sort of a way to talk honestly about things that we might not say just in day-to-day -day life, but that theater creates the opportunity, the, the conversation allows it to take place. How does, you know, you mentioned, and, and Jessica was talking about post the elections was significant violence because of the two tribes, the fight against the two major tribes in Kenya. And now today you have terrorism, you have Al-Shabaab, you have Al-Qaeda, you have some ISIS cells there. What impact does terrorism have on Kenya today, on Kibera today, and on Shosko? Well, Kennedy wrote a great op-ed I would encourage everyone to look at um, called Terrorism's Fertile Ground. And to paraphrase, I think the sort of the thesis was, you know, what are we fighting? Are we fighting terrorism or are we fighting poverty? And what really is the fertile ground for terrorism? And I think the argument was it is places like Kibera, um, places where people are so disenfranchised, so disempowered, that the only option that are available to them are those provided by groups like Al-Shabaab, like Al-Qaeda, and that they knowingly prey on that vulnerability. One of the things that you started, which was had gr very great success, and someone who stood out to me was Priscilla. You know, she mm -hmm. was, as you read the book, you, you discover stories of individuals who joined, were the first class admitted mm -hmm. to um, the Kybera School for Girls. And I thought how difficult it must have been to go through all those applications and think of those young girls and who gets in and who gets out, sort of a Sophie's Choice. What are the great successes that you've had so far? Who are the, what's, what are some of the stories that stand out? There are a couple of them. And I have to say it's really good to see a, a young girl at the age of four living with them up to um, up to seventh grade, you know, they came to school without speaking any English, you know, and uh, you are able to guide them until now. So my hope is that uh, they want to be leaders, you know, and they want to be leaders with dignity, you know, who cares about the country. So for me to say that is very, very, is for me is a success. And the idea of hope, because think about this place, we don't really dream, and now there's a dream, you know, and I think with hope you can really, you can make it, you can have that kind of a drive for change. So. I believe that we are creating the future women leaders in our country. And you can see the, uh, on their face, six of them came to, to New York and they were really just amazing, talking to people and sharing their dreams. You know, So that really makes me a little bit excited. Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I think that Priscilla is a great story if you read the book. Um, sort of a young, a young girl and her family's battle against HIV um, and her triumph, ultimately. But also, um, if you look at, um, if you Google Eunice from the Kibera School for Girls, I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, so she was is our, in our oldest class of girls and was invited to speak at Lincoln Center a year ago. And so she came to speak in front of 2,300 people and performed a poem she'd written. And just to see you know, her dreams, her confidence, her poise is, is I think, pretty awe-inspiring. So there's so many stories of both the girls in the school and people using our other programs. But I think it's amazing to see just that, that energy, that vibrancy, and that hopefulness for the future 
take hold both in the girls, but also in their families and the ripple out to the community. Kennedy, you wrote a, <laughs> several years ago, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about what you called slum tourism. And slum tourism is something, unfortunately, that I, when I read the piece that I had participated in, because I visited Soweto, and slum tourism is tourists visiting communities to observe poverty firsthand. And you said that while slum tourism has its advocates, you were opposed to it. Slum tourism turns poverty into entertainment. And it's a one-way, your perspective was, it's a one-way street. They get their photos and we lose a piece of our dignity. Do you still feel that way? Is your, have you changed your opinion or do you still feel strongly about that? Uh, I, I would still think that way. Why laughing? Why, why are you laughing? <laughs> it's a, I, I got a lot of uh, emails and calls from that, from other oped, maybe from tourist companies, and it was it was crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I also think is I also think the idea was to make it more is good to think about these issues. You know, sometimes we don't know the power that we have. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's good just to reflect about this. You know, but uh, I don't say that. Uh, you don't have to go visit your friend. You have a friend somewhere. You know, you, you, you're free to go visit your friend. But it's really horrible. What I saw as a kid and growing up was, just think about it. Somebody comes and take your picture, they move away, and then I saw also one thing happen, which is so sad. A woman was giving, was giving birth to a baby in our shacks, you know? That was before I came to America, when I was still a very poor man. And these tourists who are coming and taking pictures. Think about that. So those are the things that really kind of really got haunted and I became really against those kind of idea. And there was the, it was only one way, you know? There was, there's no sharing, nothing to talk about. They come back to the apartment, say, oh, look, eh? I was in this slum. And I felt it's a way also to fulfill your ego of you being lucky and be like, oh my God, eh? these people really suffer. Anyway, so I think I come from that experience from the other side. <laughs> yeah. I think part of the conversation was also sort of about partnership. And so, you know, what is the intention of the person going into the community? Is it just to take a picture and then, you know, you leave with your photo and not giving anything. Yeah, back. yeah. And so sort of what are you leaving there? And I think that I mean, I can't speak for you, but you can agree or disagree, but that there's a difference to sort of coming in and, and partnership and, and participating in some meaningful way and change the community and viewing, being a, um, an outsider in that space, but from that perspective, as opposed to just coming in, taking a picture and, and leaving. With and security, with big guns, you know? Yeah. They work with your own. So I think there was also a you know, conversation and unfortunately you only get so many words, but that it was also about what is meaningful partnership and what are those, the dynamics of those partnerships? You know, who is the person setting the terms? What are the parameters? How is the community actively engaged in, in that conversation? And what is the awareness of that power dynamic? One of the things is a good way to start a conversation about it. It's something that people have been really trying to neglect to talk about. And there's been nobody really to come out to speak about it. And I thought as somebody who have experienced it firsthand, I want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. How does your relationship work? How, do, how does that? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. I also was curious reading the book. You know, I, I, I was thinking like, there's a yin yang here. There's a there's a concrete person. There's a dreamer. There's a visionary. There's a what? What do you? How do you bounce off each other? What roles do you play in sort of um, in Chosco in building a relation in in building an organization? How do you play off each other? Okay. <laughs> Paul, <yeah? laughs> you're a good interviewer, I can see. So what <laughs> what's happening here is that uh, we have a lot of things in, uh, similar, but we also have a big difference. So this is simple. So Kennedy is from, from the street. You know, I grew up on the street. I understand my community. I understand the side of the poverty. I, I lived it firsthand. And I really honestly, I didn't understand the other side of the world. Uh, you know, I didn't understand how the system, systems work. I'm being honest, you know. Then Jessica come from your world, yeah? <laughs> and we are able, she's very much, uh, she's really good into the systems and 
data and all those kind of things. You know? So what happened was that we were able to compile this force together. Because what happened in most of the nonprofits, most of the companies, is that you come with your Western knowledge, doesn't really work on the ground. If I, let's be honest. You know what I mean? It doesn't really work sometimes on the ground. How many PhD you have? I've seen this on the research. People come to do research, they don't get the right answer. I'm like, man, this question, no, won't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I can give that point of view. Then at the same time, if I'm running something in, in Kibera or in a slum somewhere, I don't understand what's called entrepreneurship. What is this innovation? Are we together? So, uh, but, so, so that brings a gap. There's a wall. And I think our partnership kind of breaks the wall. You know what I mean? That's what I feel it. Mm. Well, Jessica, add something. <laughs> <laughs> Yang? Uh, yeah, no, I think that um, we're both, you know, dreamers and have a vision of what the world, how it could look differently. Um, at the same time, I think like I'm much more, like I like lists and systems and Excel spreadsheets. Spreadsheet. Yeah, exactly. That school that was mind boggling. Was yeah, and, and Kennedy's like, what, why do you, he's like, sees where it's heading. And so I think that it's, um, most of the time it works really well that we have those different perspectives and sometimes we have to start like realize that we're not speaking the same language and figure out like how to how to change that, how to meet in the middle. Um, but I think that the sort of the underpinning that, that guides it is sort of a shared value system, a shared risk taking mentality, um, and a sort of shared vision of, of what might be possible. Well, well, I'll give you a quick example, quickly. <laughs> oh, Think no. about this. <laughs> So I was around 50 years old. I was working in a factory earning $1 for 10 hours. And I was very much angry for the society of how poor we are. We, people look down on us. Then I came with this idea of a soccer ball. And I called my community together. And the question they asked me was like, where are the money going to come from? Who are the donors? And I said, no. We're going to form a movement. This is not a non-profit. We, we are feeling so tired, and enough is enough. We can't wait for anybody to help us. We're going to help ourselves. So that's how Shofko was formed. So, I mean, so, you can, so I'm coming from that kind of end, you know what I mean? Whereby it's now action. So if I could really thought about those ideas, like where the money going to come, who going to write the proposals? I did not write a proposal, to be honest. I mean, so that's where I come from. And then Jessica come from a, a world where things are organized, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's true, <laughs> you know, she's very, very organized. And so both together, we were able, able to work well. What were some of the failures? You know, you talked about successes, but we also really learned from our failures. What were some of those failures that really helped you understand how to get to further success? Were there significant ones along the way? Failure that I really, let's see, failure that we, we are in a very early stages. I think that the world is not ready for grassroots organizations. It took us a lot of time to convince people to get the support. And that was really, really, really t t tough, you know? To how do you convince that? Actually, in Africa, we sometimes have a bad name. How do you convince that something you are doing in the middle of, of the slum is accountable? How do they believe that? So that was really, was, was tough for us to, 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 raise, uh, to raise support for that. And even now, we are working now on something called so as somebody who lived in this kind of tough life, I believe in comprehensive. I believe in whereby it's a holistic approach to all these issues. When you're not healthy, my friend, you cannot go to school, cannot work. And Kibera is really congested. So we have a school that links social services like healthcare and clean water, which really works very well. But even now, many people and maybe researchers have not, done, have not really come, uh, come with the idea of comprehensive way of fighting poverty. So that's still a challenge up to now. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is just really hard and that um, is, you know, behavior change takes a long time. And so getting people to change, you know, hygiene practices, getting people, we're seeing like one thing we're really working on is the drop off at nine months after, you know, if somebody gives birth, that there has been, I think, more uptake, more education about immunizations. So people bring their babies to the clinic for the first nine months, they get immunized. Once that's done, there's a huge drop off in under five milestone achievement. And I think part of the thing that we're realizing is just those shifts are, are not fast. 
And I think that the, one of the challenges is we live in a world that expects results and sort of huge transformational systems change overnight, and that actually to make change sustainable and to make it systemic, it, it's slow. And when you say that we live in that world where change and expectations, isn't that part of the philanthropic donor community yeah. now that they want to see yeah. this return on the investments or the ROI and how difficult that is? Because totally. I think that there's, you know, grant cycles are a year, three to five years. I mean, if you think about it, what is, these are problems that have taken hundreds of years to cement themselves. And so a three to five year grant cycle isn't probably going to be the, the long term change. And I think that there is a push, a, you know, a positive push in the philanthropic community towards more measurable outcomes, towards clearer results, but at the same time, that comes with a lack of realism about what, and, and, and actually I think it also puts pressures up on organizations to talk about um, sort of more, less long-term change, but to talk about sort of the low-hanging fruit as opposed to the deep, intractable problems. What are the biggest mistakes that NGOs make, non-government organizations make, when they try to affect change in Africa in Kenya, in Kibera? I mean, I think one of the biggest mistakes is that solutions are dropped in from the outside. And I think that there isn't, there's a lot of talk about, you know, grassroots is one of the biggest buzzwords in the NGO community. I think it's lost meaning. What does grassroots really mean? And I what think- What does it mean? Tell me from your perspective, what does grassroots mean? Uh, what's your what's your sort if they've lost yeah. it? What what should they? What are they? What have they lost? What are they not understanding? I think it's more than having you know local people involved. It's about having the people who live the problems really designing the solution, and having real meaningful, not token leadership of the people who experience the challenges that you're trying to solve, and that they ultimately most intimately understand the consequences and as a result, the solution. And I think that um, there's a lot of sort of token uh, conversations about local leadership, but not real decision-making power. Anything to add there? Yeah, so yeah, I agree with Jessica. Uh, and I think another thing people don't get is money is not that, is money cannot solve the problem. It's all about money. No, it's not about money. It's not about money. It's the entire people think it's the money, you know? And I think it's really, and it is, it's a tough, or I don't want to lie to you, it's really tough to work with the grassroots, to work with the community, because you're working with somebody who is vulnerable. If you, let's be honest, if you ask me in Kibera, when my many years back, do you want uh, shoes? Yes, because I have that fear like I won't get it, you know? It's, it's going, you know? So uh, how do you make me feel like Kennedy? If you don't like the shoes, don't worry, but we can still do something else. You know what I mean? So, but we have this kind of feeling that we have nothing. So if you come with your ideas that you're gonna solve our problems, I won't say no. That's a fact. So how do you find a way that community become more honest with you? And I think it's more about listening, you know, and communicating, you know, and understanding the, where you're working. So that's what I think more. is about how can we listen? Because everybody will tell you that they are working in the community, they want this. And if you think about yourself, you are really, really poor. You know, you don't have anything. You are you are struggling for the basic needs, something to go to your stomach. And then somebody come and say, you know what? I want to build your house, and maybe you need education. Will you say no? You'll be like, yes. Everything is yes, yes. <laughs> you know, and that's really <laughs> that's a understanding of the power dynamics, and that um, there is a lack of honest conversation because the conversation is loaded and that people feel like if you say no to this, you might not get this other thing. And that that creates um, a, lack of, a lack of honesty about what the real needs are. You know, there was, a, there was a story on NPR not long ago that some NGOs in Nairobi have to pay locals to attend meetings. And it said residents of Kibera have a message for foreign aid groups. If you want to come hear us, what you have to say, you need to pay us. This is what it was alleging. So many non-governmental organizations have flooded Kibera, was the story, that many locals have become disillusioned, which you're basically talking about. 
and by those who say they want to help. And so they say, if you want me to come and tell your story, pay me to come. Is that accurate? Uh, so yeah, yes, yeah. So yeah. Because what really happened is is sharp. So not only to come and listen to your story and pay. So when the big NGOs came to Kibera, what they used to do? This thing called conferences. A lot of talk, talk, talk. Okay. I remember uh, kicking aids out of Kibera. I'm like, how do we kick aid? You know, by playing soccer. I don't get it. You know. So this thing is happening a lot of them, and they invite you to go for a big hotel, and they pay for you. You know. So people really get used to this kind of payment. Like, oh, you are an NGO? When is the conference? So if you take me to a conference <laughs> with no pay, I'm not coming. So what, <laughs> it, what impact does that have upon a community? I mean, you have now a professional class of attendees in some respects. Yeah, yeah we have them. I mean, I think that it's, um, so we definitely see it. And I think that it is sort of dying off, and the, and the thing that happens is like NGOs come in who don't have a real local presence, and they pay these sitting fees for people to show up for their meetings. And actually, when we were first starting out, it was a real struggle because people, you know, had this expectation that if you're not going to pay me, I'm not going to come. That has really shifted, I think, in in the way that we do our work, which is we never pay anyone to show up for a meeting. It's not our meeting. But that's the difference, that these NGOs are the ones setting the agenda. So it's their meeting, their agenda. Sure, you should maybe pay people to go. I think how people feel about our work is they're like, this is our meeting. We're the ones leading it. We're the ones setting the agenda. We've never even been asked or something like that. But I think that the challenge is that in Kibera, real presence of NGOs, not really. If you come and walk around, like I'm there almost every day, I don't see other programs, other organizations, but I think what happens is people come in and run programs that are transient, they're short-term, they're grant cycle funded, and that creates a real problem because there is no meaningful systemic change that's left by these programs, and you create a cycle of sort of don't, like, um, like donor frenzy almost. And then something else we also do which is very powerful is we are really, we are a grassroots that became really major known, you know, I think. And we still have our headquarters in Kibera. And other people, people really think that's weird, you know, like how, you know, if you want to meet us, you come to Kibera. So we've been able to make Kibera still our Kibera, you know. So that's also a difference. So most of the organization, they work in Kibera, and they have these big offices outside. There, there's <laughs> been a lot of talk recently about the end of poverty. Mm -hmm. The Gates Foundation talks about the end of poverty. Um, the SAC talks about the end of poverty. When you live and work in a community like Kibera, are you able to envision and see an end to poverty? Do you see that as realistic? Do you see that as long range? What, how do you respond or hear when you hear those words, ending poverty? What's your sort of reaction? I think the future looks really good if you think about it, because I think the future would be the technology. And how is able to unite people? And I think the, you know, the, even the learning. I remember some kids in, in Kibera now are much more better than me, you know, because of this kind of phones. You know, the people really able to connect and fight their uh, dictators through social media. But at the same time, we have to be careful with something called Africa rising. That's a problem because the, the challenge facing the population now in Africa and in, and in Kenya is the employment. So there's a lot of growth for 2%. <laughs> because this 2% earn a lot, so they can, they can now affect the number, and you see something called Africa rising. And yet, if you go to the slums, you see the poverty people are passing through, it's scary. So I'm a little bit scared that Africa is going to face a lot of uprising as the population starts growing and no job. And even the system of education is not still good. So things are tough. I think that there's a real, um, you know, a, an organization. Yeah, an, ex an, an expedited um, desire to congratulate ourselves. Like even in the conversation that's been happening about the transition from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that, yes, the MDGs were achieved for some slices of the poor, but not for the very, very most poor. And that, you know, even looking at um, the focus of funding, there's a lot of funding going to secondary education with the idea that universal primary education has been globally achieved. And I can tell you 
in communities like Kibera, we're nowhere near universal primary education access. And so I think that for the most poor, we're nowhere near the end of poverty. So part of the problem and part of the future of, of changing that is how do we get resources actually in the hands of communities that are envisioning and enacting their own solutions? Because I think the end of poverty, unfortunately, won't be led by outside actors, but it actually has to come from communities themselves. Thank you. Now I'm going to thank them for joining me, and uh, we'll now take questions from the um, from all of you. Who's got any questions? What's your name again? Natasha. Thank you, Natasha. So Zazi said something about Mukuru. We are now start working in Mukuru, Kwajenga. Yes, and I, I agree with you. When we went there, there's a lot of there's nothing going on there in the in like the way in Kibera is, you know. So but how we work is this. People come to us, uh, especially for Mazda. We also work in Madare now. We have come, uh, you know, and the, these young leaders from these communities are able to come and say, listen. We want to start Shofko in these areas. So we are able to share our resources with them. So that's what we are doing now. So we are now in Mukuru, and uh, I love working there. So we are in um, Mukuru, Kwajenga. We're moving into Bangladesh and Mombasa, um, and we're in Mathare. But part of how we've expanded to these communities is I think there's a lot of talk about scale also in the development world. And this idea that you can sort of take an approach and like cookie cutter, hand it to another community and it will work as well. And part of how we've done it is we have young people from these communities. So in the crew, a group of young people came to us and said, we want to do, we want to use this model in our community. Can you help us do it? And Kennedy said, you know, no, I'm not from your community. <laughs> You're from your community. You know what your community needs. And over, you know, a one and a half year period, we've built capacity, we've shared our work, we've made our you know, resources accessible, and a, a group of young people in each of the communities we're expanding to has led that expansion. And so we're not just sort of helicoptering in and saying, here's something that worked in Kibera, even though it was designed by somebody from Kibera, but recognizing that these communities have similarities but also idiosyncrasies. And how do you identify local leaders and give them the tools and resources to take it and scale it in that community? A lot of the scaling you're talking about. What's your um, name, please? My name is Jan. Talking about scale, a lot of the services you're providing, you would argue, provide, provide ideally by many people. I'm wondering what your relationship is with the government so far. And if you envision up eventually involve working closely with Absolutely. So Dan, uh, those are good points. If you think about it is that the government and the county government, they're not doing anything in the slum. And that's the why the reason I say that we can't wait anymore. But I've seen also some changes, you know. The more people are getting more em empowered and they're getting to know their rights. I've seen right now the government's coming in. We have some roads, it is good. And we're also getting some health, uh, health, health medicines from the Ministry of Health. So my idea is that community, if you keep on sleeping, you're going to be taken advantage of. But if you wake up, you start doing your own things, they go, you're going to catch attention of them. You know? So right now, we're really catching the attention. And it's sometimes rough, but mostly good. Whoever you cannot engage the government when the community now have what, that they have their agenda. We have to have agenda before, <laughs> before reaching out. And what I'm seeing now in Kibera is that the government and the leaders are approaching us. How can we work together? Yeah. yeah I just, Go just, ahead. I was just going to say, I think part of our model is actually how do you build a community framework that works? And with that in existence, then eventually state actors could come in and overlay. But part of the challenge, I think, then part of, I mean, there's a multifaceted problem, but um, part of the reason that they're not doing that is just how do you enter? What's the point of entry? How do you actually work successfully 
in these really complex, dynamic urban landscapes. And so I think part of our vision is how do you actually build a community framework? How do you build delivery models that work and that could be actually overlaid by actors like the government? Why have you decided never to run for office? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He won ma the mayor of Cabrera without an election. Yeah, it was right. a much easier route. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't have to run for re-election. <laughs> but, but Paul, I'll tell you something. The, the, the thing we have been really missing in Africa, we have been focusing a lot on the top. That I'll go on the top, I'm going to change things. Uh, I've seen some of my people that I know I respected a lot to get to the government, and they become normal people. They become thieves. And I'm like, man, I gave you respect. What happened? So I realized what I have to do now. Let's go to the grassroots level. Let's go. If we start from the grassroots level, change. And then we make our leaders accountable. That's the change I love. So I think no need for me to go to political office. What I'll be doing in my country is to go to the grassroots and empowering the communities to know their rights and to know their power. So therefore, they can do what? They can ask for accountability. Okay. Then what that means will mean that we're going to end up voting for real people. One success, I would say, is, a, is in PESA. Um, and so I don't know if people have heard of Safaricom, but they're the largest um, telecom in East Africa. And they've innovated a, a mobile payment model called M-PESA that's accessible really to almost everyone. Um, that's a mobile money transfer model that for people who are perhaps unbanked, um, and I think it's, it's greatly democratized access to finance. Um, and so I think M-Pesa is a huge, a huge success story. And it's simple, it's demand-driven, um, and it answers, it solves a real problem. And I think what's so smart about M-Pesa is they didn't sort of just wake up and say, oh, we're interested in technology, how do we create technology that helps people? They took a specific problem and they created an answer for it. And something I'm just going to talk about now is uh, we have a system of a card. So through, through technology, we are able to access the social mobility you work with thousands and thousands of people. How do you know you're having impact as an NGO? You know what I mean? Through technology, we are able to have people's data, what they, what, how much they were earning before, and since they joined our programs, what are the changes? And just can you add more on that, please? Yeah, so we're using like real-time data as sort of a tool to understand impact, and how we're doing that is we're using Salesforce. Um, and so every single user of our system gets an ID card with a scannable barcode. And so we're able to track in real time what's happening to our users over from the time they begin through their experience of our intervention. Thanks. Yay. Thank you so much. Uh, and is, it, it, I think it, it, is a <clears throat> it has been much more to do with the economic issue. And what happened there is being used by the politician. Because if you think about it, uh, the elite in Kenya, there is no tribal. You know what I mean? Much. There's not much tribal. It's about their friendship, you know? But when it comes during election time, the poor really suffer a lot. They are killing each other because of. And that's really tough. So what we try to do is that we try to create committees in Kibera, whereby we have Nubians who are Muslims, we have Luos, and we have Kikui. So we bring, we try, we try to be sensitive. That's to be honest. We have to be very, very sensitive on who do we admit in the school, and then we have to have these local leaders, elders that from across. And because it's much more to do is that much more to do with uh, with, uh, with 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 politics, and it's becoming really, really big, big issue. So, and Kibera, those who don't know, 
Kibera is kind of the face of Kenya. So when Kibera burns, the entire Kenya burns. And in post-election violence, it all started in Kibera. So Kibera is a slum where it has all the tribes. And when there's a problem, they all go to their own tribal, tribal angles, you know? And that become a big deal, you know? So what I'm really working on that is to be aware of that as a sensitive issue by trying to work with everybody and try to admit all the students from different tr the ethnic community. That's Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.